The hindrance to becoming Christ-like is not from any outside mm. source coming at us. Yeah. It comes from within. Yeah, it comes from us. Yeah, yeah, it is okay. possible. It is possible. Yeah. Are you living the life you've always wanted? How do you know? Are you closer to Jesus than you were before? Do you see yourself growing in grace and the knowledge of Christ? In this series on spiritual formation, longtime friends Jim and George address these questions and more. Join us as we talk about the essential things needed to live the life God intended for us to live. The persons we become is the most important thing that God gets out of our lives and what others get as well. Dig in with us and let's learn to become Christ-like from scripture and from the lives of many of the church's teachers. Here we go. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, George. Good morning. This is morning here. It is morning today. Yeah. So far. Yeah. <laughs> it's been morning so far. Uh, glad to be with you. It's um, so good to be here. We're in the middle or maybe on the early stages. We think we might be in this series for a little while. Yeah. I think we'll be here quite a, quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. So this is episode four. And we do have a crisis in, in, in uh, amongst ourselves, and that is we haven't decided what we're going to no. name this no. series yet. Maybe by the time you have listened to uh, started it, we've had it, but we're maybe not. So in case we're not there yet— we want to ask you guys, what do you think we should name this series? Yeah. So that, would, that would be wonderful. We've tossed around some ideas. Yeah, yeah. So we're not yeah. totally in the dark here, but mm-hmm. we haven't settled either, which is yeah. which is great. If you yeah. can't name something, don't. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That's the right way to think about it. It's good to know where we've been to in the series so far. It is. Just at the start. we've We did the first three episodes. We talked about... What is spiritual formation? We kind of right. defined it and said a few things about it. Uh, then we talked about, we're talking about Christian spiritual formation. Distinctively Christian. Distinctively Christian, because spiritual formation can be a term used by anyone and everyone. <clears throat> and we're okay with that, but we want to talk about Christ as the central part the central player, the central agent in spiritual formation. We, we are big fans of that. The centrality of That's Jesus. Right. That's yeah. right. We believe that. And then we talk about grace and the role of grace in spiritual formation. So that that's where we've been. And um, we're going to go from there. And we're going to keep talking about some of that. You're going to yeah. hear that come back up, yeah. some of those. Yeah, all of those, all yeah. of those things are essential aspects of spiritual formation. So we'll be talking about them as yeah. we go along. Yeah, we can't get away from them and still be talking about it. We are going to start with a reading. Kind yeah. of, We don't do this every episode, uh, but we we like to stay in. We've been in Colossians 3, yeah. go, going back to the previous series. Mm-hmm. Uh, we like doing that, have, yeah. a, have just a moment before we jump in with, with the Scripture reflectively. Maybe it's important to just say why Colossians 3. For me, Colossians 3 is such a succinct expression of life with God, what it's like. It's giving practical ways of looking at that and understanding that. So by reading it, my spirit is formed by the reading itself. Mm, That's good. It has been such an important part of our growth has Mm -hmm. been— coming to know and reflect on this scripture. Yeah. I think some people would say this is the only place where you get a whole summary of all of this life with God in such a succinct kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. Super dense. Yeah. So just give us a bite. Yeah. So I'm going to read from 5 to 8 and maybe focus on verse 8 and what is it saying to you today? Okay. I'll listen. Put to death... Therefore, anytime you read therefore, you have to ask what it's there for. <laughs> so it's based on verses 1 and 4. We've okay. been raised with Christ. We've died with him. 
Um, our lives are hidden with him. We think on things above, not on things of the earth. Mm-hmm. Let's not get our lives bogged down by the things of earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, so put to death because of all this. So there's a part that we play, put to death. Mm-hmm. Whatever in you is earthly, um, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things. In verse 5, he says, put to death. Mm. Now there's another command. Get rid of these things. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. Uh, Get rid of what? All such things. He's not naming everything we need to get rid of, but things that are born from these things and these things themselves, Mm. like anger, wrath, Malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. But now you must get rid of all such things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your lips. One of my thoughts from that, verse 8 specifically, is all of those dark traits that we're well acquainted with are are typically, and the verse sort of already cues us in, but they're typically manifested in our words, often expressed through what we say and It's just a reminder for me that the words coming out of my mouth are reflecting Mm -hmm. the realities that are residing within. Mm -hmm. Nothing new there, of course, uh, probably for any of us, but it's a reminder. Yeah. What's coming out is not haphazardly coming out. There may be moments where I'm out of control and it's just flowing, but... It's a reflection of something deeper. Yeah. What about you? What I thought about is, um, like, if you focus on anger, if I focus on getting rid of anger and malice and slander and the rest of it, it becomes a chore for me. Like, don't be angry. Mm. Don't be slanderous, don't be all of these things. And and we ought not to be. This is the command, get rid of these things. But the focus is on the other side of these things. Mm -hmm. How do we get rid of these things? You cannot do these things and be loving at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So focus on becoming the loving kind of person that Jesus was. This is, this is what spiritual formation is. Mm. Focus and practice the kinds of ways you can be loving toward other people, yeah. like praying for them, like doing something good for, for them, like um, coming alongside of them, mm-hmm. you know, those, those kinds of ways of loving other people. Uh, that has worked in my life in an indirect kind of way to get rid of these things in my own life. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, you put on a virtue and the virtue takes care mm-hmm. of <laughs> yes. the, the negative aspects yeah. of, of yeah. your character. Yeah. You That's know? good. We yeah. look to Jesus and yeah. Yeah. learn to emulate and imitate what yeah. he's about. It's good. Thank you, George. Yeah. That's good. So today we're going to talk 
we're going to bring another topic into this conversation of spiritual formation. Um, and the question is, if Jesus is the goal of spiritual formation, is it really possible? I mean, it's a high, 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 high calling to become like Christ. Absolutely. I mean, who are we to even think? Is that, that a presumptuous question? Is that a presumptuous question? Yeah. yeah. So start us off, Jim. Like, yeah. Is it possible? Yeah, that this, I think it is. A, it is a right question in this conversation about if if we're really committed to becoming like Christ. It's I think it's worth pausing and say, really, <laughs> is that possible for us? And I, as we've talked, there's been there's kind of two common extremes that we could contrast yeah. that will help us maybe get there a little more easily. <clears throat> One extreme would be I'll use a bumper sticker that uh, Dallas used to use. Uh, I don't see these bumper stickers anymore, but I have seen them, and it would say, Christians aren't perfect, dot, 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 just forgiven. And Dallas used to say, there's a lot of space between <laughs> <laughs> just forgiven and perfect. Yeah. So I think we can avoid those two extremes. And so in case that's not real clear, uh, say a few words about those two extremes, what we mean by yeah. those two. We, we kind of think of it in terms, I'm saved, I'm forgiven of my sins. And perfection is somewhere in heaven, in some future life or something like that. Right. Meanwhile, I'm just going to struggle my way right. and do what I can and try hard and all of this. And I don't need a, a direct path or a, a plan or a way to become more and more mature in my faith. Right. So we've kind of uh, did the extremes. I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, heaven is in the future. Meanwhile, I'm going to struggle all the way through this. Yeah, that's right. And I think spiritual formation says, no, there's lots of and lots and lots of growth happening, can happen between the time we were converted to the time when we will be perfected. That's right. We can make progress, we can develop, we can grow we can become more and more like Jesus as we move towards perfection. So we're, we're giving an answer to that question with a resounding yes. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to be, become like Jesus? Yeah. And our answer is yes. But we want to make sure you're hearing us clearly say, d we don't have to put in that yes, the idea that we, we think that we're really getting close to being perfect or sinless. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's really not our concern here, it's can we grow becoming more like Jesus? And we're also asking, can we have a hand in it? Mm. Can we participate yeah. in that formation? Yeah. And we're saying yes yeah. to that. And so th that also says the hindrance to becoming Christ-like is not from any outside mm. source coming at us. Yeah. It comes yeah. from within. Yeah, it comes from us. Yeah. Yeah, it is okay. possible. It is possible. Yeah. So, um, you know, let's use this acrostic that we've brought up before. Uh, Vim, um, vision, intention in means. Mm -hmm. we, we've we really come to love this short uh, model because we can say one of the things that we've learned is if we want to make progress in something or if we want to accomplish, if, we, if you want to do a project in your basement with wood, uh, if, if I want to achieve a, a new um, distance on my bike, whatever it is, three things have to be in place generally. We have to have a vision for that. I want to create this new piece of art or I want to go this far on my bike. We have to have a vision for that. 
But we also have to have intention. It's not enough just to have a lofty idea and now bring it home to become like Jesus. We have to really want to become like Jesus. Mm-hmm. We have to really want to do what we need to do to achieve that goal, whether mm-hmm. it's the bike or the pen or the woodwork or whatever. But it's not enough just to have the vision and want to. We, ha- we have to have a plan that's measurable, that's tangible, uh, that there has to be steps that we can bring into our lives that are effective for us. Mm-hmm. And so if we think about this in terms of Jesus, I think one thing we want to say here is that Jesus had a vision, intention, and means for his own life. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had a vision, and that vision for his life was anchored in his identity. Mm-hmm. He, As the beloved that's right. son of God. That's yes. right. He had a vision for his life. And it, it, there's no question that the, at the center, the bullseye of that life was a cross. Mm-hmm. It's where he was headed. But there was so much that was connected to and, and nurturing and feeding that vision. And then he intended to do it. Mm-hmm. The, the, the boy, there were times that without the intention, he would have quit. Yeah, but it took a lot of courage. It took a lot of saying no to some things, to his own will, for example, and let the Father's will dominate his, his life. Yes. Uh, it took uh, facing temptations and all kinds of things that came in the way, but with commitment and courage, Jesus intentionally overcame to achieve the vision that he had for his life, that God had for his life, that he had to rescue you and me and the world from our disaster. Yes. So his will and resolve was set. We see that. But here's the interesting part. He also, as Luke tells us, was growing and developing. Yeah. And so there were measures in his life. There were practices he was engaging Mm -hmm. that was nurturing this vision. He wasn't getting there simply alone out of the force of his will. Correct. Or out of the um, divine essence that he was. That's not what drove his growth. As a divine being, there's there's no growth needed. Yeah, that's right. There's, there's perfection there. Yeah. But Jesus was 100% human as well. That's right. At the same time. Yeah. And as a human being, he needed wisdom to live life. And he grew in that wisdom. That's right. Yeah, and there were threats to the vision. Otherwise, and, and those threats were called temptations. Mm-hmm. If we don't understand that, the chances are really slim. The possibility is is for us to become like him. That's right. Because we have threats to our formation, our becoming like Jesus. Our t- we have lots of temptations. Mm-hmm. And one, one thing that we want to bring out is, as did Jesus, they were real. Yeah. He was tempted in all ways like we are. That's exactly right. Yet yeah. without. Yeah. Sinning. Yeah. So mm-hmm. the writer of Hebrews says, we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses during temptation. Right. And Jesus then himself gives the challenge, the possibility of becoming like him. That's he right. He turns to his disciples and he teaches them, a disciple or an apprentice is not above his teacher. But when his life is formed and shaped in such a way that he can become like his teacher. So it is possible to become like our teacher because Jesus recognized and Jesus trained his disciples to become like he is. That's right. His inner faith, his inner character, all of that is accessible to us. Like his loving ways, his forgiving ways, his gentle and kind and faithful ways are all not just aspirations for us, but can actually become reality in the way we do our life today. So 
-hmm. I think Jesus himself would say, follow me, and it is possible that you become That's right. like me. And, you know, I, th I remember a time in my life hearing that or something like that. It, it sounded a little bit audacious. Yeah. Or, or maybe sometimes we use the word bodacious, bodacious. you know. And it sounded like, wow, that's kind of arrogant to think that we would actually become like that. And then I started reading my Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I started picking up, not from just one place, but sort of all over the place, whether it's Paul asking us to imitate yeah. Christ, or he's imploring us to set our minds, or it's it's watching how Jesus is interact with his disciples and the expectation mm -hmm. that we see in him that they make progress his way. Yeah. It it confronted that attitude I had that and, and maybe I would say resistance, mm -hmm. George, to be on an intentional path. To become like Christ. That yeah. doesn't have to be a statement of presumption or pretense or arrogance. It's There was a time in the history of the church, some, some denominations, where the Sermon on the Mount was something unattainable for us. So it was relegated to some future kingdom the Sermon on the Mount is describing something in the future. It's not for today. It's for something that is going to come at some point in the future. Mm. And um, they did not see the possibility that we can actually live the Sermon on the Mount today because the Sermon on the Mount is what it's like to be like Jesus. <laughs> so true. And, and you know, there's a, there's a part of us that can see how you can— get there because all of us have moments of discouragement, yeah. you know, even after walking with Jesus where you, you you kind of pause and say, Lord, am I getting any better, yeah. you know, because we're dealing with the brokenness and sin that's still residing deep within us. But we hear Jesus saying in the sermon, unless your righteousness Exceeds. is greater than that of scribes and Pharisees. He's not be he's not saying be better morally than them, yeah. I don't think. Yeah. He's talking about what's inside. Yeah. The way I absorbed becoming Christ like that that language was not used mm -hmm. when I first became a no. follower of Jesus. Um what what was put forward is this is how we do church in our setting, in mm -hmm. our context, in our, in our um, denomination. Uh, we tithe, we witness, we read the Bible, we study, we go on missions. Uh, and all of those are f wonderful expressions yes. of what it is to become like Christ. But for some reason, the language of intentionally and putting the means in place and having a vision of this ultimate way of being like Jesus, it just didn't bleed through for me. Mm -hmm. So we came to it, I came to it later in life, and uh, it, it has such a gripping, gripping um, strength and force to it mm -hmm. that it, it doesn't leave. There may be people out there listening to us who have not gotten a hold of this yet, Jim. Is what is this going to do for me? Well, it's going to change the way you see everything. The it way is. you see Jesus, that it is possible to become like him, to live like he did from the inside out, to be uh, a friend of Jesus and to keep his company and to do life as he would do it if he were in my place. Yeah, that's good. You know, I've, I've reflected, we've reflected a lot through the years on what was the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And I think one of the words that we've sometimes used just in conversations is behavioralism. Mm -hmm. And I think that that way of sometimes what's called discipleship there, it's, it can be, and there's models out there that can be filled with these really good behaviors, like what you, some of what you mentioned, go to church, mm -hmm. tithe, share your faith, read your Bible, pray. Please never hear us saying, 
We recommend you don't do those things. <laughs> but what we, I think what we learned, I'm really repeating, and maybe in my own language, what you just said, is if what we're calling being a follower of Jesus is simply doing those things, carrying out those activities, we know we have come to know ourselves well enough to know that won't get us there by yeah. simply there's a lot of doing in spiritual formation, but the focus is it has to be deeper to becoming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Becoming will get you to doing. Yeah. Doing won't necessarily doing alone won't necessarily get you to becoming. And really, I mean these these things that I mentioned, the going to church, the tithing and, mm-hmm. and studying and reading scriptures and all of that. Those are means. They are the they're means. They're not. They're not. Yeah. They're not the end. It's not the vision. It's not the vision. Yeah. Yeah. Not, the vision is not for me to do my devotionals every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The vision is for me to become like Christ. Yeah. And when that is central, the other things, the means, then uh, would. I would look at those intelligently and say which which of these are moving me in that direction mm-hmm. and do those things. Yeah. You know, one one idea that might help if it, this isn't landing yet, like uh, as a pastor, two of the metrics that are often present for church life is um, baptisms and bucks. You know, how much money are we taking in? How many people are we baptizing? Then maybe how many people are coming to church mm-hmm. on Sunday? And we've learned Bucks, baptisms and and uh, butts. Yeah, and butts. Yeah, that's right. How many butts are in the seat? And so, like, we don't think those are bad indicators. They can be healthy indicators, but but we know we've all we've learned methods that we can employ to to increase. All three of those. Mm-hmm. We also know we could do those things and not necessarily be living as the body of Christ as God wants us to be living. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. we could be doing those things and not being yeah. kind to each other or to our neighbors in the community. And so we want to kind of – that's a little bit simpler illustration to apply to our lives. Like we don't want to just have the fruit of our lives being I'm giving money, I'm sharing my faith, I'm reading mm-hmm. my Bible mm-hmm. – and I'm praying, therefore, I'm becoming like Jesus. Because we can do those things, but if our focus is not on throwing those things away, but I'm going to nurture an inner life that's becoming like Jesus. That's right. We believe those things will be yeah. in the wake yeah. of that. Yeah. They'll be present. Yeah. Is it possible to become like Jesus with a changed heart? It is possible. We want to say yes yeah. to that. And these don't necessarily change our hearts. That's right. They they. They, they change our behavior. They can maybe. be a means of getting at it. For a while. For a but, while. Yeah. 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 So there's no life in them in and of themselves. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good start. Yeah. Um, we want you to, those of you who are listening to really think about this, maybe a good question is what means... We're in Jesus' life. Maybe that's a good way to end today, George. Yeah. Let's reflect on a few means in Jesus' life that he was employing to help him along the way. Yeah. Like, what did Jesus do to become Jesus? Yeah, that's right. (laughs) You know, like, was he able to do all the things that his life was— uh, able to accomplish at age two, right? No, no, that's right. How about at age twelve? Right. No, no. But he grew. He grew. And what were some of the practices that that helped him in that process? That's right. What was his relationship with God like? Like Jesus prayed constantly. That would be one. That would be one practice of prayer in his life. That's right. And we'll have a lot more to say about these practices, and each of them will get its own, its own yeah, episode attention. in the future. Yeah. Um, uh, he he worshipped. Mm-hmm. He practiced Sabbath. Yeah. yeah. He rested. 
he prioritized rest, like he planned rest into his life. Yeah, that's right. Because it was a custom for him mm -hmm. to get away and, and to do yeah. that. Uh, and he practiced Sabbath with his people. Mm, that's as, a good as one. As a group of people. In community, they practice Sabbath. That's one I thought of, is he, he participated in the tradition of his heritage, and he he was living his life among a people yeah. who were often really broken, some of them who became his adversaries, but he lived among them. And I think that's that's been really important to me recently because there's so much temptation to see the brokenness in, in our communities and want just to opt out. Mm. Um, nothing usually gets solved with that kind yeah. of mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, but he stayed with his people. Yeah. Throughout. And I think that was a discipline. That was yeah. a means of his life. So. I think the Apostle Paul believed this and all the disciples and all the apostles and all the writers of the New Testament believed deeply in, in the deepest ways in their lives that it is be, it is possible to become Christ-like. And if we read Paul, if we read Peter, if we read John, they all point us to that possibility. Right. Paul himself, himself said, um, we have been predestined to be conformed to the image mm, of Christ. Of his likeness, yeah. He also said like something like, train yourself to become a godly person. Yeah. So you quoted if Romans 8. If that's not and, possible, yeah. Romans 8, 1 Timothy chapter 4, yeah. verse 8, 7 and 8. Like that, yeah. If that's not possible, they would, they would be lying to us. Right. Yeah. And right. if we don't see it in the life of Peter to become more and more Christ-like, like, can you imagine him, like at the beginning, the arrogant, proud, yeah. compulsive yeah. Um, person that he was, right. faithless person that he was, to then standing in front of a crowd of 3,000 and 5,000 and proclaiming the changes that he now have come to possess because he dared to believe, yeah. and Jesus taught him that he can become something different. That's right. Someone else. Even with a pretty pretty massive failure in the mm -hmm. middle of that, too. Yeah. So yeah. that's good. So we, we leave that with, with all of us. Is it possible, possible to become like Jesus? Yeah. And we want to and say with humility, yes. The quicker we get a hold of that, that notion and believe that it is possible— the earlier we can start in our development process. And I think we, this ought to be teach standard teaching to children. Yes. It ought to be standard teaching to youth, to adults. We never outlive that notion of we, we don't arrive, but we can be arriving all through That's our right. lives. To go back where we started to the bumper sticker, we are forgiven. Yeah. And, and we're so grateful. And, mm -hmm. and we never graduate, in a sense, of being this fragile person forgiven. But there's much more yeah. to say about our life with Jesus than just forgiven. Let me be provocative and say something here at the end of the show sure. and, and leave it with a bombshell. If the cross could only accomplish the forgiveness of our sins, what a waste. Mm. I am being provocative on yeah. purpose. Yeah. Like if our lives cannot change between the moment of our forgiveness and to live the rest of our lives doing on our own what we can. Right. Without the, the possibility of becoming Christ-like and the means and the commitment and the empowerment and the grace, then there's something wasteful about what Jesus did on the cross. Mm. That's good. Well, you heard it here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, George. Till next time. See you soon. Bless you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Soul Renovate podcast. Any of the scriptures or resources that we mentioned in this episode will be linked in our show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, 
Be sure to leave us a review and subscribe on your favorite podcasting app because it really helps us to share these conversations with more Christian leaders like you. And if you have any questions you'd like Jam and George to answer, you can email us at info at soulrenovate.us. Soul Renovate is a ministry of Christ First Counseling Center, and it exists to propel Christian leaders to abide in Christ and grow in His likeness. Soul Renovate is made possible by the generous support of people like you. If you'd like to support us, you can do that on our website, soulrenovate.us. And if you'd like to learn more about Soul Renovate, you can also do that on our website, soulrenovate.us. This podcast is produced by me, Dalton Huey, with the help of Gil Hara. Our cover art was designed by Hannah Huey, and our music is by The Fox's Forest. Thanks again for listening. Till next time.